Hi everybody, James Aspie here with a very special guest. It is an absolute honor to introduce Dr. Michael Clapper. Dr. Michael Clapper is one of the leading plant-based doctors. He is paving the way so that people like me and so many others can learn about the benefits of a plant-based diet and spread that message to so many others. So welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. It's been a bit of a mission, but we finally <laughs> found a good spot. I wanted to make it perfect because the wisdom that Dr. Clapper has is just so valuable. And this is just such, a, yeah, such an honor to be here with you and to, for you to be able to share with us some of the things you've learned in your years. So thank you so much. You're most welcome, James. It's good to get this very important message out to your viewers. Absolutely. So first, I thought you could start by just introducing yourself and some of your background. Oh, well, I'm Dr. Michael Clapper. I'm a Western-trained physician, graduate of the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago back 45 years ago. And I've been practicing acute care medicine for the past 45 years, but for the past uh, 35 of those, I've been a plant-based physician because I've seen the power of a whole food plant-based diet to reverse so many of the diseases that people bring to my office, the obesity, the clogged arteries, the high blood pressure, the inflamed joints, the broken out skin. Uh, it turns out it's uh, from what we're eating. The Western diet has become so toxic based on meats and dairy products and hydrogenated oils and refined sugars and preservatives and flavorings. The, the, the food stream has become so uh, unbalancing in our tissues that it sets off diseases in so many organs that uh, if we put people on a plant-based diet, these diseases go away by and large. The obesity melts away and the high blood pressure comes down and the arteries open up and the skin clears and the bowels start working well. And I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthier. And, uh, <laughs> and that's the word I want to bring because everyone can do this. A whole food plant-based diet really is the key uh, to being a healthy person and staying out of the clutches of people like me, actually. So you're one of those doctors that takes people off the medications rather than adds more medications to their life. Indeed, that's exactly what I'm finding in my medical career. When I was a young doctor, uh, people would leave the intensive care unit and we would put them on beta blockers for their arrhythmias and antihypertensives for their blood pressures and antibiotics for their infection. Now the fun is as they get healthier, uh, oh, let's get them off that one, doesn't, doesn't need that one, wow. oh, let's stop that one. Now, now the fun's getting them off their pills. That so, is amazing. So they don't need to come to the doctors. Go live your lives and be healthy people is what I want for my patients. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's what they want too, of course. Indeed, I tell them I want to see you in the health food store and on the bike pass. That's the only place <laughs> I want to see you. <laughs> and how likely is somebody to get healthier from adopting a plant-based diet? Well, you know, it comes down to some very simple things. Uh, you know, when you stop hitting yourself in the head with a hammer, the headaches go away, you know? And when you stop injuring your tissues, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with this toxic food load, when you start putting a food stream in that, that uh, brings stability and antioxidants and phytonutrients that calm down inflammation, when you bathe your tissues with that day after day, month after month, most of these diseases go away. They, they were caused by the abnormal diet and you get on a healing diet, most of these go away. They're not going to turn a, 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 a badly uh, crippled 90-year-old person into a, a marathon runner. Uh, but since most of the diseases are caused by our Western meat and dairy-based diet, getting them on a truly healthy diet makes these diseases go away. It's nothing that mysterious, though the medical profession still somehow mm. doesn't want to open fully to it. Mm. Uh, but that's going to change as well. Absolutely. But um, again, you know, how likely is it that someone where, who's obese, who has high blood pressure and diabetes will get better if they adopt a, high, a whole food plant-based diet? About, the odds are about 100% wow. by a large course. So, and, uh, and what about you know, every now and then I'd come in contact with people who say that they tried a plant-based diet and it wasn't for them, they couldn't do it for whatever reason. Is there anybody who truly, for whatever reason, can't adopt a plant-based diet? Or is this something that is for everyone or at least almost everyone? 
That's such an important question, James. I'm glad we are dealing with that. <clears throat> and on my website, drclapper.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com, I have a webinar entitled Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet, and it goes into how to do plant-based nutrition right. And I encourage uh, people to go there and watch the video. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, people, it's wonderful they want to adopt a plant-based diet for, to help the planet and the animals, but you've got to do it right. Mm -hmm. and, and I covered this in the video, but first of all, you've got to eat the whole foods. You've got to eat the big salads and hearty vegetable soups and steamed greens and, and whole grains. Uh, you can't do it on energy drinks and granola bars. You've got to really eat the, the nourishing food. Uh, you need to make sure you get a couple of other uh, nutrients, enough iodine for your thyroid, uh, uh, and some, maybe some sea vegetables, a little pinch of iodized salt. There's a few things you need to do. And so perhaps some of those folks who uh, didn't uh, attain success with this uh, were maybe shortchanging themselves on a, on a couple of these nutrients like the iodine or um, uh, uh, sometimes zinc uh, can, uh, if they're not eating enough whole grains mm -hmm. and root vegetables. But some folks, find themselves, especially after 30, 40, 50 years of, of a, a flesh-based diet, we get dependent upon meat-based nutrients. Remember, in our society, at age six months of age, when the baby is still nursing on the breast or sucking at the bottle, that jar of baby lamb and baby turkey and baby chicken is open with the best intentions in the world from the parents. Your mother didn't know, my mother didn't yeah. know. But from that point on, three times a day, four times a day, animal flesh is slathered on that child's intestine all through infancy, childhood, puberty, their teens, their 20s, their 30s. Well, you eat animal flesh three times a day for 20, 30 years, you're going to become adapted to that food stream. And I believe that uh, in our tissues, that uh, especially our muscles that make uh, nutrients like carnitine and creatine important for muscle function, and we make those out of the amino acids in our diet. But if they're coming in three times a day preformed in your food since infancy, there's a good chance that some people, the genes that make your own carnitine and creatine, they'll downregulate, they'll get a little lazy because it's coming in preformed. Mm -hmm. Then when the person at age 30 or, or 18 or 25 adopts a plant-based diet, suddenly they're on their own as far as making all that carnitine. You've got to gear up all your own right now. And some people may take a few months to wake up those genes and wake up those enzymes. And during that time, they draw down on their own carnitine, creatine stores and they don't feel so good, and then they eat some meat and that preform carnitine, creatine, and it's not a matter of those two nutrients, That's, they're, they're emblematic of hundreds of muscle associated nutrients. As they wash their tissues, well, they really feel better, so I'm a paleo guy. Mm -hmm. But and I, said, I think that's what we're seeing. But I want to stress, this is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency that we create by feeding animal flesh three times a day to an infant. Sure. No other primate does that. No gorilla does that. No chimpanzee does that. It's a, it's a human thing. And we create this dependency on the meat. And then when we suddenly take it away, some folks uh, may feel uh, uh, withdrawal symptoms from it. Uh, what's the answer? These folks may need to phase out the meat gradually. They mm -hmm. may to need to eat it uh, once a week uh, or once every few days and then stretch it out more and more and more until finally their own enzymes gear up and they, can, they don't need it anymore. And, and fair enough, but I think those two things, people either living on, on vegan junk foods and just not eating the right whole food plant-based diet or they have a meat dependency that, that's lingering and may take a longer time to get off. I think those are the two factors when we see the folks who don't, aren't doing well. But they're both overcomable uh, by, sure. uh, by gradually introducing a, a really healthy diet, well, at least completely a, 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 a whole food plant-based diet. You introduce that immediately. But uh, they may have to wean themselves off the meat over a few months. Okay. Makes sense. That's interesting. I actually hadn't heard that before. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are stuck on the belief that they are omnivores. Obviously, when so many people are doing so much better in terms of health on a plant-based diet, it would suggest that that doesn't really make sense. But is there any truth to that statement that 
we are omnivorous in terms of our physiology or what we're, how we're made. Right, oh, we're, there's absolutely no question. We are not omnivores, we are herbivores. And anyone who has any question about that, I urge you to fire up YouTube and see the presentation by Dr. Milton Mills, M-I-L-L-S-M-D. Uh, and Dr. Mills outlines this, the argument specifically regarding our anatomy. Um, Omnivores are animals like bears and raccoons, and their jaws go up and down. They can't chew from side to side if they wanted to. We have rotary jaws, long intestinal tracts, and many other uh, traits that clearly mark us as an herbivore. And again, Dr. Milton Mills uh, goes to this in detail, and I urge you to watch that. But there's no question um, that we are made to run on plants. Our digestive system evolved to handle plants. Uh, our simian ancestors have been eating leaves and fruits for 150 million years. We are uh, of that ilk. So, but people say, but I can eat meat and, and I seem to handle it okay. That doesn't mean your body is not set up to run on plant-based foods. You can uh, take your gasoline burning engine and mix in a little bit of diesel fuel, a little bit of kerosene in it, it'll still run. You can mix in a little more kerosene, it'll still run. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you're gonna start following up the spark plugs and the, uh, and the gas line. Um, but, it, but, it, but you're able to put some you know, kerosene in there, Say, but it was always a gasoline burning engine. It was never not designed to run on gasoline, even though you can dirty up the fuel a bit. And the same thing, you know, we can eat some meat. And I'm sure that sca scavenging carcasses uh, on the African plains a million years ago probably got us through famine times. You know, we do have that ability. But it's an emergency famine fuel. It's not our, our daily fare, and certainly not three times a day like we're eating flesh now. Mm. So, um, no, we are herbivores, and it just depends how far from that diet we want to stray. The further away we stray from a plant-based diet, the more disease uh, we, uh, we invite into our body. Absolutely. And what kind of what kind of state would you describe the general health of the world right now? And and what kind of potential do we have if we all adopted a plant based diet? Oh my! Probably the most important question of the ages uh, at this point. The state of the world is dire. I have been a physician 45 years, and the world physically was different back in the 70s and 80s, and I watched the 90s and 2000s go by in the 2000s and 10s, and I've seen many changes in the world that are very worrisome. Um, we knew back in the 80s and the 90s that we needed to stop eating animals or there'd be dire consequences, and we didn't really reduce our flesh consumption, and now the the ice caps are melting and the species are disappearing because the industrial production of animal flesh is the driving force behind every single environmental destruction we face. That's why the forests are disappearing. That's where the water is going to irrigate cropland for, for cheeseburger growth, uh, for growing the, the animals to make into cheeseburgers. That's where the soil is eroding off of our farmlands, growing corn and soybeans for animal fodder. And most of the greenhouse gases are coming from 70 billion creatures that are bred every year, all breathing out methane and carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and uh, eating grains that have been grown with uh, ammonia fertilizers. All these put the greenhouse gases into the air. And, and time is getting short. The seas are rising, the ice caps are melting. And I urge the readers to go to the website of Dr. Richard Oppenlander called Comfortably Unaware comfortablyunaware.com and read Dr. Oppelander's book, see the videos on his website. He makes it very clear that you can put solar panels on everybody's house, you can give electric cars to everybody on the planet, but if we continue to produce and consume animals as we are, at the rate we are currently doing it, um, we are in store for irreversible uh, runaway global warming. Uh, a adoption to a plant-based diet is the most effective way to stop global warming and stabilize the environment. But it's the only practical one. You, you know, it's gonna take years to uh, put up solar panels mm -hmm. and wind farms, but everybody could stop eating animals tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it costs nothing. And the sacrifice is what? Ordering the bean chili instead of the beef chili. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all we're really talking about. But yeah. it makes all the difference in the world. 
So it's the one practical thing. Plus the food is delicious. It's so good. It's the delicious. bean chili is great. Oh, I would Italian. never have ordered it, but now when I eat it, I'm so glad because really? it's delicious. And then you do an Italian style, Chinese, Mexican, yeah. East Indian. You're going to have fun with the cuisine. The food is delicious. But changing to a plant-based diet is the key to our personal survival. It'll it'll healthy up your own body, but it'll healthy up this planet. It'll healthy up our future. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And I know that's why you're so passionate. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we can't forget the plight of 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 the horrific suffering that we inflict on these innocent creatures. Seventy billion mm -hmm. creatures every year are slaughtered on this planet. Mm -hmm. What right do we have as a species to inflict that? kind of death and suffering on an industrial scale on these creatures because we like the way they taste. Mm. You know, we, we don't, there's no other reason. We don't need them nutritionally. And um, so for every reason that you can think of, it's time for humanity, each one of us as an individuals, but human, homo sapiens as a species, to take the next step of evolution and evolve to a plant-based diet Absolutely. and let meat eating recede into this dark, dark past. Where it belongs. Whatever meat eating was, we have used it up. Sure. It, it, whatever, sir, whatever the great hunt and all that was in humans, it doesn't matter. We've used flesh eating up. We've used the oceans up. It's time to evolve. Time to, to, to evolve. A non-violent well plant-based diet. Absolutely. I think it's fascinating that the healthiest diet is also the best for our fellow species and the best for the planet. It's nature talking to us. Oh, the universe is jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah, right up. Eat the plants, eat the plants. <laughs> you know, we're getting all sorts of messages and we disregard them at our peril. Many do, and but many are starting to realize. Yes, yeah. and, and, and it's exciting. Uh, I can't believe I'm finally uh, saying these words, but your generation, you know, <laughs> uh, six months ago, I was 35, you know, and, uh, and three months ago, I was 50, and uh, last week, I was 60, and just turned 70. And it goes awesome. by so fast. Um, but thank heavens for your generation and the kids after you. Sure. Um, you folks are waking up. They, mm. they say you can't keep a hat pin in a cloth bag for very long. You know, the point comes out. And the, the truth is, as we've talked about, it's time to stop eating animals for every reason. And thank heavens for the social medium. Thank heavens mm. for dedicated activists like you who are willing to sacrifice their own well-being to get this message out. And, uh, and you, you give me hope, all of you out there give me hope. Mm -hmm. And together, we can change, uh, we can change the future and turn into a livable, lovable one. Absolutely, and I think that, you know, activists like me and other people, we wouldn't have anywhere near the same amount of power in our message if we weren't so confident with how healthy it is. And that's because of the dedication and commitment from doctors like yourself, so we, this whole movement, the vegan movement and the plant-based community, and you know, we all owe such a debt of gratitude to all of you for that. It's, it's paved the way for us to be able to say with confidence, this is the right way for every reason. So thank you so much for that. I got one more question that a lot of people seem to be confused about, and that is about soy, mm -hmm. whether it's healthy, mm -hmm. hopefully it is because it's so versatile, it's <laughs> chocolate, it's ice cream, it's uh, milk, it can be vegan meats. Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people are confused, or at least they believe that soy is unhealthy, it can cause issues, especially with, um, with the hormones in women and even in men. So what are your thoughts on that? Right. I have been in the movement long enough to remember back in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s, um, a book called Diet for New America by John Robbins came out, a number of similar uh, books came out um, that exposed the reality of uh, the meat industry and, uh, and meat-based diets, and meat consumption started going down. And uh, the meat industry uh, and their uh, associates in the Weston Price Foundation started, they unleashed this anti-soy tsunami because they saw, this, saw the soy products were starting to eat into the profits of the meat. And uh, so they unleashed this anti-soy tsunami. They put out all this outrageous um, uh, pseudo-information mm -hmm. because uh, soybeans have genistein and, um, and uh, diazine, a uh, molecules that have a resemblance to estrogens. The, the poisonous 
uh, misinformation they put oh don't eat uh, don't, don't eat soy if, if, he, if your son eats tofu he's going to turn him gay mm -hmm. and your husband's going to grow man boobs and you're going to get breast cancer and all these oh don't eat soy and and it's still echoing out there today sure, it, it echoes in your very question yeah. and so they were absolutely brilliant what they didn't do is take a look at the medical studies that show that the countries who consume the most soy have the least breast cancer mm -hmm. that women who consume soy have less breast cancer because these uh, phytoestrogens, phyto means plant, and these plant estrogens occupy the receptor sites on the breast tissue that the real estrogens that would drive cancer growth uh, would lock onto, so they, uh, so they exert an anti-cancer effect. Women who, can, who have breast cancer and consume soy products live longer, uh, wow. truth of it is. It, it, does not, it, it prevents the, uh, uh, the, the spread of the cancers aggressively. Um, so the truth is, um, the um, uh, vast majority of people have absolutely no concern about soy. There are some people who are a bit of soy sensitive, and if a woman gets very tender breasts around her period, she probably shouldn't be eating two pounds of tofu and drinking mm -hmm. six glasses of soy milk a day. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a few cubes of, of tofu in your stir fry or a little splash of, uh, of soy milk on your cereal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely benign, and in fact, it's quite uh, healthful, beneficial. Uh, beneficial. Wow. But I just want to point out that at the same time, these folks are saying don't eat soy because of the phytoestrogen. They're all for dairy products, milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt. And today's dairy cows have been genetically modified, so they will give milk all the way through their pregnancy. They used to dry up when they got pregnant. Now they give milk all the way through their pregnancy. So today's dairy products are made from the milk of pregnant cows. And the estrogen content of this milk is through the roof. You mm -hmm. give it to, to people to drink, their, their, the boy's testosterone level plummets, their, their urine and within 15 minutes is pouring with estrogen, progesterone, estradiol, and, and as I said, lowers testosterone levels in boys. And the hypocrisy of the, the people proposing these arguments of don't eat soy, it's got phytoestrogen, but have all the milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt you want brimming with active mammalian estrogen. This is not, these are not the puny little phytoestrogens in soy, these are official mammalian wow. estrogens. Have all of that that you want. Okay, that, yeah. I think, is what's driving the precocious puberty we're seeing in our little girls who are going through puberty mm -hmm. age eight and nine. Now, could it be from that river of milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt they're pouring down their throats full of cow active mammalian estrogens? That's where the concern should be, not to the little phytoestrogens in soy. And I just wanted to point that out. That, Interesting uh, point. And especially people who are still consuming dairy products, vegetarians uh, who haven't made the move to vegan, realize that, that those dairy products are loaded with active estrogens and they do not do good things in your body. Are there any other things for children, I know a lot of a lot of mums and dads who are unaware are feeding dairy to their children. Mm -hmm. Are there any other negative consequences for kids so young that they could expect? I think maybe asthma or something. Oh, uh, if there's one product I would pull out of children's diet, it would be dairy products without question. As you already implied, um, the dairy protein, the casein and lactobumin uh, can set off allergies, certainly makes asthma worse, sets off post-nasal drip and sinus infections, uh, but also uh, cows get leukemia and the... Um, and it's caused by a virus, bovine leukemia virus, and, it's, and most of the dairy herds are infected with leukemia virus. And fragments of leukemia virus gets, uh, uh, as kids drink the milk, um, fragments of the virus uh, can wind up in uh, breast tissue, which later can go malignant when the girl gets older. And also the protein in cow's milk, um, the uh, beta lactalbumin, gets out into the bloodstream uh, the body makes antibodies against it that then attack the pancreas mm -hmm. and destroy the insulin-producing cells. And there, there, are many people, there are many doctors who believe that one of the major causes of that vicious type 1 diabetes where the uh, pancreas gets destroyed has to do with feeding cow's milk protein to infants and getting this autoimmune reaction. Right. So between the protein making allergies worse, the, uh, uh, the inciting of the type 1 diabetes, leukemia viruses, why would you want to feed this to your child? Mm. Yeah, especially, again, there's so many these wonderful plant milks now, the almond milk and oat milk and hemp milk. Uh, there's always these wonderful drinking beverages. Really, it's time to, uh, 
uh, to see that cow's milk is for baby calves. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And B12, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that we can't get these days from a plant-based diet. Is there any worries at all with just taking a supplement instead? Right, no, and uh, it's an important question. People say, well, if a vegan diet is natural and healthy, why do I have to take a supplement? Uh, vitamin B12 is absolutely essential for, to keep your brain working, your spinal cord, your bone marrow making normal blood, but um, we have to take it in, in our diet. Uh, where does it come from? It's made by bacteria that live in the soil. And throughout history, we spent all day for, for, foraging for roots and tubers, and we pull them up out of the ground and knock them on our uh, leg and, and eat them. And we get B12 producing organisms uh, on the surface of the vegetables. Uh, we would drink from streams or be B12 uh, bacteria in the, in the stream water. And so B12 supplementation was never a problem. But welcome to the 21st century with modern sanitation. Nobody's drinking out of streams. All the vegetables are washed in chlorinated water. So the natural B12 sources have dropped out of the modern plant eater's life. And it's because of modern sanitation that the vegans now have to take a B12 supplement. Mm -hmm. But it's a small price for not having to deal with cholera and typhoid fever. I, you know, it's good to, that we've got clean water. Sure. But meanwhile, it means that we've got to take a B12 supplement. So take a, so once a week, squirt, put a little squirt of B12 under your tongue. Yeah. Uh, and be done it takes with one it. second. Exactly. There's no reason not to. Go, eat a plant-based yeah, diet. Exactly right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much covered everything. Okay. So uh, maybe one more short thing. I know okay, I said sure. one question like okay. five questions ago, uh, but you know how it is. Okay. Um, you know, typical day of eating for you. Right. What, what would be a typical, typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Yes. Uh, I get up in the morning. Uh, we usually have porridge, uh, have yeah. hot cereal with uh, lots of blueberries. Sometimes more blueberries than porridge. <laughs> uh, with a little splash of almond milk on it, and. Uh, uh, like some type of fresh fruit uh, as well, a can uh, grapefruit or cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. um, lunch and dinner are basically the same. Um, I'm a guy, I live on soup, salads, and greens and beans. And so okay. I have a big salad for lunch and dinner. I, my wife always has a crock pot full of really hearty vegetable soup on the counter, so I have a bowl of that. And um, usually some type of healthy starch, either sweet potato or quinoa or uh, uh, farro, one of the grains. Um, and legumes show up sometime during the day. A, a, a scoop of lentil stew, a hummus sandwich, a bean burrito. Um, so lunch and dinner is, uh, is soup, salads, and greens and beans in some form or another. And, uh, and then we usually have some berries with some almond milk in the evening watching TV or uh, yeah. before we get to go to bed. Sounds delicious and mm. very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you so much for your You're time. So I greatly appreciate it. I'm sure everyone watching this video has learned so much and greatly appreciates your time and efforts as well. So thank you so very oh, much. Oh, you're so welcome. All it's the been best a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. I salute you for your good work. Likewise. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.